Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, for our South Asian Heritage Month literature event, The Legacy of Nora Nayat Khan. We are joined by Noor's biographer, Shrabani Basu, and Joseph Miller from the Royal British Legion, who is the Remembrance Manager at the Royal British Legion, and Paul McHugh, who is trustee of Secret World War II, an organization that works towards the remembrance and a legacy of SOEs. Shrabani, would you like to introduce, well, for those of us that don't actually know much about Noor and her incredible story, would you like to introduce her to the audience? Of course. Um, shall I, uh, I want to show some images. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> Sorry for the slight delay. Technical hitches, as always. Um, and Natasha, shall we, sh I'd like to share the screen if you'd like to bring yeah. them up. And Absolutely. I will tell Noor's story. Is that up? Sorry, do I press share screen? No, no, you are, your screen is already shared. You just need to open your presentation and then you are okay. ready to go. And okay. then make it full screen. Yep, slideshow, here we go, slideshow. Are we on? Show. Okay, yes. perfect. <laughs> Hi, everybody, once again. Um, so I am, over the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to briefly run through the life of uh, Nuri Nayib Khan. Um, I've named, called her the spy princess in my book. Uh, so who was the spy princess? Well, on 13 September 1944, uh, she lay dead on the floor of a concentration camp in Dachau. She had been brutally tortured and shot through the head by a Nazi. And um, the Germans did not even know her real name. They knew her as Nora Baker, a British spy. So who was Nurun Nisa Inayat Khan? And how did she land up on the floor of a concentration camp in Dachau? Well, she was uh, a descendant of Tipu Sultan. Uh, many of you may know he was the ruler of Mysore. And uh, to you know, trace her journey and how she ended up where she did, uh, let's just go through her life a bit. So her father is Hazrat Inayat Khan. He was a Sufi and he left uh, for in, from India. Uh, he was told by his, his master to take Sufism to the West, which is why he left his homeland of Baroda and went to the US. And, uh, you know, being a good Indian, he took his brothers with him and they all traveled together. Um, and here they are in their colorful costumes. They wore their turbans. They all were musicians and they called themselves the royal musicians of Hindustan. They toured and Inayat Khan gave lectures. And it was one of these lectures that he met the beautiful Ora Ray Baker, an American, and um, they fell instantly in love. So, uh, but of course, Ora's father, uh, you know, um, her, her family objected to her wanting to go away with a man with a flowing beard and no income. Um, and uh, she ran away. So both, both of them went to London where they were married and Ora took the name of Amina Begum and started wearing uh, sari and, you know, sort of the golden colors that matched her husband's clothes. So from London, Inayat Khan now got an invitation to go to Moscow to play uh, at, a, at a music hall. So family packed up again, they went to Moscow, and it was in Moscow in 1914, on the 1st of January, that uh, Noor was born. So here she is, baby Noor, her proud father is holding her up. He called her Babuli, uh, which means father's daughter. Uh, of course, her full name was Nurun Nisa Inayat Khan, uh, and she was also called the Pir Zadi, daughter of the Pir. Uh, but Moscow at this time was full of discontent, and the family had to flee. So they left, and they went once again to London, where they lived in Gordon Square, and three more children were born. So here we are. This is Vilayat, the second born, who was very close to Noor. Noor, of course, is here. And these, this is uh, Hidayat, and this is little baby Claire, the uncles in the background. And so it's a very happy family, 
but uh, they lived the war years here. Hidayat sang to Indian soldiers. Um, he met Gandhi, and uh, but he was warned that you know the British were watching him because he was quite a nationalist. He believed in Indian independence, and uh, they said you should leave. You know, France is a friendlier country. Go to France. So the family once again packed all their instruments. They left for France, and it was here on the outskirts of Paris that um, they set up their family home. The home was called Fazal Manzil, which means house of blessing. It is still the family home. It's in Suren, uh, just outside Paris. Uh, and the children would sit on these steps, look out over the lights of Paris. It's on a slight hill. They would dress in their Indian clothes. All kids love, you know, playing, playing with uh, sort of costumes and clothes. Uh, it was a very happy, idyllic childhood. Uh, but then, Hazrat Inayat Khan, their father, started missing India and he wanted to go back. So he went to India and some of them knew, you know, the family knew that he would never come back. He died in Delhi and Noor was only 13. She now had to look after all her siblings. Her mother was so depressed that she wouldn't come out of her bedroom and it fell to little Noor to take charge. And she started writing poems. She started drawing her mother out of her isolation. You can see this poem to our sweet Amma, how sweet and pure uh, the flowers rise. She started getting her mother to you know, get back to Western clothes, as you can see her here again with her mother. And uh, slowly, Amina Begum started recovering. Uh, and of course, Noor is also growing up at this time. The family are all musicians. I mean, music is something that ran through this family. So here's Noor, she used to play the harp. This is Claire, she used to play the piano. Vilayat played the cello, and this is Hidayat, he played the violin. Um, Noor also, after her schooling, joins the university. She studies music at Ecole Normale, and uh, she also plays the veena, which was her father's instrument. This is the oriental room in, in uh, Fazal Manzil, and you can see her sitting there playing the veena. Uh, Noor also fell in love at this stage. She fell in love with a musician, but the family objected, so she's torn between her, uh, you know, the love of her life and her family, and she writes a lot of poetry, and she's also growing up to be a little bit of a dreamer and a writer of children's stories. So she now writes her first book, uh, which is called The 20 Jataka Tales. And this is published in 1939. She, her stories are being published in French newspapers. They're all children's stories. She's a budding writer uh, and she's seeing a bright future, but it is 1939 and the war clouds are gathering around Europe. So, you know, all these dreams uh, are going to be shattered soon. Uh, in 1940, with the German army just on the outskirts of Paris, Noor and Vilayat, as you can see them here, they're all adults now. So Noor and Vilayat take um, a decision. They decide that they are going to go to England. They, they decide that they are Sufis. They believe in nonviolence, uh, but they're going to join the war effort. They're going to go, they're going to sign up, and they believe they can't stand and watch fascism. They cannot stand back and watch this occupation of their beloved France. So they leave, uh, you know, join all the refugees and they leave uh, Paris to go to London, catch the last ferry and they are out. Uh, in a bombed out London uh, with the blades, Vilayat volunteers for the RAF. That's what he wants to do. And Noor, just following her brother, decides to join the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. So here she is in her uniform. And she is now suddenly just a number, no longer the Pirzadi, no longer from a genteel, hallowed background. She now lives in a, you know, a Nissan hut. She's with other colleagues and she actually loves it. She feels really liberated um, and she feels she's doing her bit in the war. Now, Noor, crucially, is being trained as the first batch of women radio operators. And I'll come to why this is so important in a bit. But uh, because radio operations was usually done by men up to this stage. Noor is very good at radio ops. She's her Morse code is excellent and she's getting really good results. And so while she is tapping on her Morse, Noor was being watched by a society, by an organization called the Special Operations Executive. And they are looking out for people with language skills. Now, Noor was fluent in French. She's a good radio operator. She fit the bill perfectly. 
So she's called for an interview. Now, Noor thinks she's just going to get maybe a promotion in the RAF. She's really excited. But here in this little room, there's just one man interviewing her. And he talks to her in French. And then he tells her that you're going to be sent to France with a code name. And you won't be in uniform. So you're going to be a secret agent. If, if you are caught, you will be shot. And will you take the job? And Noor says, yes. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, she's determined to do her bit. So there is more in the book about why she wants to do this. Um, so she, she says, yes, she signs up. And her secret life is now about to begin. Suddenly, her colleagues in WAF find that she, Noor has disappeared. There's just a folded blanket, no address. They feel betrayed, but Noor can't share anything with them. She leaves on her, on her training, which begins in all these country houses spread around England. And this is one of the main training schools. It's in Bewley in Hampshire. It still stands there. You can see a, the plaque in the church where agents prayed before they left. So here, Noor is taught to live a life in secret. She's taught her Morse code. She is taught how to break locks, how to set up a wireless, how to find sources, how to um, you know, set up dead letter boxes, live letter boxes. And the work of the SOE is basically to help the resistance movements in the occupied countries. So what they are going to do is supply arms, supply money, help the resistance to resist the Germans and prepare for the D-Day landings. So that is the task on hand and Noor is training for it. She's given a code name, Madeline, and she practices her signature diligently. This is in her handwriting, as you can see. Um, and uh, she is now, she hasn't even finished her training, but because they were losing radio operators like flies, they were just, uh, the life expectancy of a radio operator was six weeks. And so Noor was needed in the field. She becomes the first woman radio operator to be infiltrated into occupied France. And here she is, she leaves on this Lysander. On the night of 16th June, it's a full moon night, the planes take off with the agents. Now, the reason they take off on a full moon night is that they can see the landing site clearly. But of course, the disadvantage is that from the field, the Germans can also see the aircraft so they can be shot. Anyway, Noor lands, she makes her way. She has, she's been given her instructions. She has to go to Paris, join the circuit, send a message that she's arrived. She does all this. She joins the circuit. It's the largest circuit in France led by this man called Francis Sutil. She sends a message to London that she has arrived in 72 hours. It's the fastest an agent has responded from the field. And she's also going to work with this man very closely, Franz Antel. But disaster is waiting for the pro uh, strikes, the prosper circuit. Within a week of Noor's landing, um, they are betrayed. And all the top people are arrested. So all her colleagues, the other wireless operator, Franz, uh, um, Francis Sutil, all, all taken in by the Gestapo. She goes underground with Franz Antel. London writes to Noor saying it's very dangerous. We're going to send you a flight. Come back. Uh, but Noor says no. She says she's the last link left in Paris and she's going to stay on and build the circuit. So Noor now starts working, doing the job of six radio operators as one person. She's the courier. She's the radio operator. She is out and about. Suddenly, this gentle musician, this writer of children's stories is transformed into Madeline, the secret agent, playing a cat and mouse game with the Gestapo. They are constantly looking for her. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why it is so dangerous, her role as a radio operator. I'll be brief because we don't have much time, but this is the radio set she has to carry. Now, the first thing she has to do is carry it around with her. It weighs 15 kilos. And um, if she's spotted with it, the Gestapo are everywhere. They're going to ask her what it is. If they find out, she's going to be arrested and shot. So that's the first danger. The second is that as she transmits, they can hear her. And the German listening devices, they start pinpointing the area. And they can just come in and arrest her within minutes. So she has to send her message. And she has to get out of there fast. And she has to think on her feet. The other thing she has to do is put up a long aerial, sometimes 15 meters long, 
So she's got to do this without attracting any attention. So I'll just give you a little brief story. Uh, one day she's putting up the aerial outside her flat on a tree and she, uh, she had to send an urgent message and suddenly she hears, excuse me, mademoiselle, and she turns around and it's a German officer. He lives in the same apartments and he asks her what she's doing. So Noor puts on all her charm and she says that she was putting up the aerial because she wanted to listen to a radio station. And she's very careful to mention a radio station that is banned. So it's like she is making, she is breaking the law in a small way. But this German officer is so impressed by Noor. He's just melting over there. And he says, I'll help you, mademoiselle. You know, he overlooks her little error and he wants to, he helps put up this aerial, not knowing that half an hour later, this agent is transmitting to London. So that's how she got away. Sometimes she would just outrun them. She would just talk her way out of a situation. And she survived for three months, more than anybody else had survived as a wireless operator in the field. Her messages were perfect. And then London said, come back because you've done your bit. And she was just about to return. But this is occupied Paris. There were informers everywhere. It was a different place from where she'd grown up. The swastika was everywhere. Gestapo is everywhere. And uh, curfews, Noor is about to go, but the night before she leaves, she, she is, her address is betrayed to the Germans. Now she was betrayed by the sister of a colleague. Um, and it's, it's a whole complicated situation. You know, a love triangle that informs um, more details later, but uh, she's betrayed. The Gestapo have her address. They come into her flat, enter her flat, waiting for her. As she enters, they arrest her. She fights back. They describe her as fighting like a tigress. She is truly the descendant of Tipu Sultan and uh, who was known as the Tiger of Mysore. So she's taken, um, this is, of course is a famous picture of Hitler near Eiffel Tower. She is now taken to 84 Avenue Foch, which is the headquarters of the Gestapo in Paris. And the prisoners are kept in these attic rooms right on top. She makes an immediate escape attempt, but she's got. She then makes a second escape attempt with two other prisoners climbing onto the roof. If this escape attempt had succeeded, it would have been ranked as one of those like, you know, like the breakouts from Holditz. But unfortunately for Noor, the RAF started bombing. The air raid sirens went off. Um, the Germans checked uh, the prisoners' rooms. They found three prisoners missing, found them on the roof, brought them down. Now, Kiefer, who was the commandant of uh, this of the Gestapo in Paris, he is about to shoot her point blank, but he can't. He just can't pull the trigger. So he then calls Berlin and he says, take her away. So Noor is classified now as Nacht und Nebel, which means night and fog, which is code for return not required to disappear in the night and fog, literally. She's now taken to a prison in Germany she is the first British woman, uh, woman agent who goes into a prison in Germany. She's taken to Forzheim prison in the heart of the Black Forest. And here she's kept in chains. Um, there are chains tying her hands together. There's chains tying her feet and a chain that passes from her feet to her hands. So she can't clean herself. She can't feed herself. She has to hop and uh, she is kept in isolation. This goes on for 10 months. She's tortured, she's beaten. Her diet is just potato peel soup and kicks, and she reveals nothing. Fellow prisoners can hear her crying, but she doesn't reveal anything. In fact, she keeps up her spirits. She just keeps on going. She somehow manages to make contact with them, and the details are all there. It's uh, you know amazing how she carries on for these 10 months, but she's revealed nothing. And finally, one day in September, uh, they come to her cell and they ask her to leave. So they take her um, in this car and she meets two, th three other agents. Uh, they're all SOE agents and they're told that they're going to be taken to a farm. So they go to the station, they're in the train. And for the first time, the girls have met each other after months. They can speak in English. Their escorting officer actually takes off their handcuffs and uh, gives them sausages and gives them some cigarettes. and. Suddenly they feel that this is a picnic. 
they look at the beautiful Bavarian hills and they have a few moments of peace, but they don't know that the person escorting them has their execution orders on him. So they go to, they take it to Munich and then they go to Dachau near Munich and they walk carrying their suitcases up to the gates of Dachau. These are the words written on every concentration camp. Uh, Dachau was the first concentration camp. Uh, it says Arbeit marked frei, which means work will set you free. But of course, that was a lie because nobody walked free from the concentration camps. Um, so all night long, Noor was isolated. She was she was classified as a dangerous prisoner. So she was beaten, tortured, maybe because of the color of her skin. She was isolated further. And after a night of brutal kicking, um, she, she the SS officer points a gun point blank at her head and shoots her. But Noor goes down screaming, Liberté, so he can't get her spirit. Her body is then taken and uh, thrown into this crematorium in Dachau. And then the ashes were scattered just outside, thousands, thousands of people who were killed there. And this is now a plaque there because it is now a flower garden. Um, so there is another plaque in Dachau, and this is in the memorial room. It says, in memory of Nurinath Khan, Madeleine of the Resistance, which is how they knew her in France. Uh, Noor was now posthumously awarded the Croix de Guerre by France, and uh, England gave her, the Britain gave her the George Cross, the highest civilian honor. Only three women have ever been honored with the George Cross from the SOE. So this was Noor's life. Um, when I wrote her biography, which was published in 2006, I got a lot of responses from people who said, thank you for writing this. Why did we know her story? And there was a lot of call for memorials for Noor. So way back then, um, before this whole debate on statues even started, uh, I started a campaign for a memorial for Noor and Ayat Khan. And in 2012, uh, we had the memorial, uh, here it is in Gordon Square in Bloomsbury, uh, and it was unveiled by Princess Anne, and in the background, these are the fannies, so this was what she was attached to, this, they, they paid their respects. Uh, it was a beautiful evening, and um, it's a beautiful memorial, so do visit it. And uh, well, this set the ball rolling as far as commemorations were concerned, and in 2014, Royal Mail asked me if, you know, we would like a stamp and of course i said yes and helped them get it and uh so here she was Nur and nisa inayat khan first class of course uh and uh, well it sort of went on from there and for ever since the book came out i had been campaigning for a blue plug for Noor. and last year 2020 uh in august when uh, so it's a year now actually um, you know, well, with all the COVID restrictions, uh, we unveiled this block on a very empty street. But I'm sure that this year and forever on, you know, lots of people will go to visit it. So here she is now up there as a blue block. And just next to the blue block, her house on Taverton Street is Gordon Square, uh, where there is a memorial. So there's a little corner of Bloomsbury, which is dedicated to Noor. So this very briefly is her story. And uh, thank you all for listening. Um, thanks, Natasha. We could exit the screen now. <laughs> Shivani, thank you so much. That was that was so powerful. It really, really was. We have a we have a comment here from somebody that I think is worth sharing with you in response mm -hmm. to your talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the book. I mean, it is it is a very depressing story, but what I take back from it is that um, it's inspiring. Her life is inspiring. So, you know, despite the ending, I think I think it drives you. It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? And and one thing I wanted to ask you, um, as her biographer, what was it about? Noor's story that first captured you and when did you first learn about her? Um, so I learned about her 
uh, years ago, of course, it was actually the 50th anniversary of VE Day. And there was a little article about uh, contribution of Indians in the war. And it was one of the Sunday papers, maybe the Times. And there was a little photograph of Noor in one corner of this piece. I mean, the whole piece was about the Indian men. So there were lots of you know, lovely photos of Indian men in turbans. And in the corner was a photo of a woman. So you know, being a woman, I was attracted to that photograph. And it's the photo of her in her WAF uniform. And all it had about her was a little caption saying, Noor Inayat Khan, a radio operator killed in Dakar. That just made me so curious. Who was she? Where did she come from? Was she a spy? Was she a Matahari figure? I just wanted to know everything. And of course, as I began my, you know, sort of journey into Noor, uh, I discovered, well, no, she was no Matahari. She was a Sufi. She was a spiritual spy. But I mean, everything about her was so interesting. And uh, then her papers were declassified, which really helped. And you know, the rest is putting it all together through various classified files and uh, the family as well, plus colleagues, friends, you know how it works. And then I wrote the biography. Yeah, it's incredible it, because it's it's so. Just even from your presentation, you can tell that you're so intimately I involved in it that you know so much about her life. And it is, it, we, we are so lucky to have you. You've been working on this for so many, many years and you've been campaigning to keep her legacy alive, to keep her memory alive and, and really the blue plaque last year and all of these things that are happening now. It really is a testament to, to all of your hard work. It really, really is. And, okay. and, you know, I congratulate you for that. This is your, ex this, you're exactly the kind of people that we need when we think about commemoration, when we think about, um, about holding on to our past and 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 taking it forward as well and 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 understanding what what legacy actually is and it, and and ha what the legacy of women is as well women in our in our in our culture and 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 this is all part of part of heritage um mm -hmm. joseph so the um hello how are you doing i'm good thank you <laughs> good thank you so much for joining us um so in terms of the Royal British Legions, um, the information that you have on Noor and, and, and Paul as well, was this was this an area where where there, there are so there are a lot of records about Noor, or was it a case of piecing together different bits and bobs that you had to to build this picture of this of this historical figure? I think I'll hand that one over to Paul as he's more of the expert on the SOE uh, rather than me. So he might be able to give a, a kind of a more detailed answer about what records there are of SOE agents. Yeah, uh, the very good news is that the personal files of most of the secret agents of the Special Operations Executive are available to the public free of charge in the National Archives at Kew. So, for example, where Shrabani showed the uh, signature of Madeleine, where mm -hmm. Noor was practicing her, her new name. That came from the, the personal file. And so in the majority of cases of the agents, you will find them there. One or two are missing, um, and they're also withheld if, they, if anyone went on to serve in the secret services after the war. Uh, but generally they're there, and it's an odd situation that if someone was a secret agent and served in SOE, you can go and get their file. Mm. If you want to find the uh, military records of your ancestor who was, um, say, a private in the army, uh, you still have to go to uh, a 10,000 backlog uh, department organization in Glasgow and pay a fee to get it done uh, and provided. Whereas with the secret agents, you can go along to queue. Uh, the special operations executive files are there but uh, not the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, which are never going to be released, I'm sure. <laughs> well, we, we can understand why, I think. But that is extraordinary. I had no idea. And I think, I think that's an interesting thing um, for people to know, particularly when, we, when we're talking about this story and i know that this story and from from the conversations that i've been having with schools and libraries and and 
communities of younger audiences that are really captured by this incredible woman. That's such an interesting thing to realize that many of us didn't know. And what a great exercise as well for people to know that they can they can access this material, that this this actually being able to um, to touch this part of history, it is a this can be an active process. This can be this can be something that you can get involved in and something that you can have a, a personal connection to. We just had it no is, idea. It is, and it's, it, it's absolutely fascinating. I'm sure Shabani found it herself that you get the file out, you have it in front of you, and you see the, that writing. You, you see mm -hmm. the person's signature on their will, and, and that really brings it home to you, thinking of that young woman signing her will and it being witnessed, and that's there on the file, the original piece of paper. Oh, my goodness. And then you see the telegrams from the field as well. So many of the messages are there. And then the the horrible bit, you know, you see missing in action, and then you see the the letters from the family, and they were heartbreaking from her brother Vilayat saying, We don't know, because a year has passed after the war is over, and they don't know where she is. You know, we haven't heard from our sister, we don't know. And he's he's so polite and he's like, I don't I know it's difficult, but you know, I need to find my sister, and then there's more. Then you have the interrogation of the Germans, and so you know the story, you know how she's arrested, you know what's happened in prison. Um, so yes, these are, I mean, there's, uh, there's an amazing amount in these files. Plus, of course, you have to look at the other files as well, because who was she working with? You know, when I was doing my research, it's, I read the files of all the other agents who she worked with, because sometimes there'd be a message in their files, which wasn't in her file. So you have to, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. You just piece it all together. But uh, this is incredible. Still pieces missing, of course, but you know, that's mm. how it is with Secret Services. And just, and just adding all, to that, I'm so sorry, carry on, Paul. Mm -hmm. that there, are, there are also in the records at Kew the interrogations of the German officers who were responsible uh, for the murder of, of Neuer. So you also get those uh, intelligence reports of the interrogation. So you hear firsthand from the Germans as to what they say happened. Good Lord. Gosh. That's how they describe her as fighting like a tigress because we have the full, I mean, the scene I describe of her arrest is given vividly because it's in the interrogation, how they follow her, how they get her, what she's wearing. You know, you just, it's so visual. You could just see the scene happening. And of course, when I was researching the book, I went to those streets. I wanted to walk those streets and feel, you know, just feel the distance from Avenue 4, C Avenue 4, I mean, that photograph, uh, it's now one of the poshest houses in Paris, lived in by people who don't even know the horrors that happened in that house. So, I mean, the whole thing is really, it is, uh, you know, goosebump moment when you read the files and you go back. It must be so grueling and it immediately makes it so personal as well. And, and that explains so much because when you talk about it, you can feel how personal it is. There's so much, you're so passionate about it and there is such a, a personal link because you are literally, you're, you're, you're steeped in it, aren't you? You are surrounded by, and that, that must be the beauty of the bones and marrow of this type of work, of this, and it's born from passion. And, and it, it's an extraordinary thing. It really is completely passion led to, mm -hmm. to, to sort of, to, to spend your time and, and commit a portion of your life to preserving the memory of people, the memory of people who who fought for the safety of others. When you when you were talking about um, the fact that she was taking care of her children after her her brothers and sisters after her father died, when she wrote this story book for children, there's such a nurturing element to to this woman's character, and that then grows and becomes apparent in in this yearning for no we need to go over there and we need to help that's what we need to do and it's very much a sufi like a sufi idea as well as soon as you said that it was like oh it makes so much sense it makes so much sense and it's it it's this wonderful nurturing thing and and that's that's echoed in you the way that you very carefully and and tenderly preserved her memory and i think that's a beautiful um, it's a beautiful echo of of the two of you that you're both that you're both working in these in these two ways. It's extraordinary. 
It really is. It was my calling, I think. I just had to do it. But I must say, it was, I wrote the book, but it was my readers who wanted a memorial. Really, I got so many letters. So it was their mm -hmm. idea. Uh, I'm an author. I, you know, I didn't know anything about <laughs> making, you know, making memorials or doing blue plaques. But uh, there we were, you know, it was them. So, yes, it's thank you to my readers as well, who really, you know, believed in Nora and wanted to see more. So. I'm glad you did. I used to talk to people about her and nobody knew who she was. And I used to go to Gordon Square. It used to be my favorite place to just sit in London and have lunch. And it was always so quiet and no one was ever there. And since the plaque, <laughs> that square is so busy. It's And she's never she's never alone now. She's never alone. No, no. She's always surrounded by people. And that, I love that. I love that. She's And she won't ever be forgotten now. And that is because of you. And it is because of the work that actually all of you do. You are all working towards remembrance. You're working towards remembrance of these people that, that died for, for, for our safety and mm -hmm. protection and it is a a beautiful beautiful thing i'd like to to hand over to joseph um for i, I believe you prepared a presentation for us okay. oh you're on mute sorry yeah it's just a short presentation so it won't take very long but it gives a good overview of what the legion does in terms of remembrance and what we mean when we talk about remembrance because it's it's a term that you know you can apply in so many different ways that it's good to have a kind of a starting point of which to base mm. our discussions on so Smashing. i'm going to bring up the presentation excellent and if you have any questions for our panelists as well please just put them in the chat window wherever you're watching this and i will pull them through um as we see them right i will are we okay Okay, so the Royal British Legion has a, a, a rather unique position in terms of its role in remembrance. Um, it's what's called the champion of remembrance. In essence, it's kind of um, the organisation that's the a, a bit like a guardian of remembrance, but probably not quite as, as, as strong as that, but it plays a very unique role in ensuring that remembrance traditions and remembrance itself is passed on. So our mission um, as part of the work of the British Legion with regards to remembrance is to ensure that remembrance is available to all, understood by all and passed on to future generations. So in essence, what that means is ensuring that communities up and down the country understand their um, history of service and sacrifice um, and that we ensure that remembrance of those who gave so much for us, as Natasha has described, is passed on to future generations, and that torch is carried on um, for a, for as long as it is it's needed. So, what is remembrance in terms of a, a concept? I guess, if you like, from the Legion's perspective. perspective. So, remembrance is the act of honouring those who serve or have served to defend our democratic freedoms and way of life. Remembrance is not about glorifying war and its symbol and its symbol, the red poppy, is a sign of both remembrance and the hope for a peaceful future. So there's a, a lot of, um, I suppose, misunderstanding that poppy represents blood in some way. And that is not true in the slightest. The poppy is about a kind of a both remembrance and a reminder that actually we need to work and strive to build a better future. And remembrance is not prescriptive. You know, the Legion specifically does not ask or dictate how anybody should remember. We would obviously like people to wear poppies, but it's a completely optional thing and up to each individual to decide how best and how they choose to remember themselves. We unite across faiths, cultures and backgrounds to remember the sacrifice of the armed, commun armed forces community from Britain and the Commonwealth. And I think this is perhaps uh, little known as well. When we talk about remembrance of the armed forces, it is both those British and Commonwealth uh, armed forces that we remember. So if we're looking at the Second World War, for example, we remember the six and a half million um, British men and women who served. And we remember the over six million who came from what was the British Empire and British Commonwealth and British territories at the time, two and a half million of which were from pre-partition India, 
which was the and was and still is the largest volunteer army in history. So who and what we remember, building off from that again, we remember the service and sacrifice of the Armed Forces community for Britain and the Commonwealth, the special contribution of families and of the emergency services, and we acknowledge uh, the innocent civilians who've lost their lives as a result or been injured as a result of conflict or acts of terrorism. So it, remembrance is about different the role played by different nations, uh, by people from different backgrounds, and by people doing different roles as well. So it's not just necessarily about soldiers, sailors, or airmen. It also does encompass the role of the emergency services and the families of those who serve and sacrifice. Uh, and why do we remember? So there are four reasons um, that Legion believe it's uh, it's in remembrance is of importance and, and, and performs a certain task. The first is as thanks. It's a chance for individuals, communities and the nation to honour those who serve and sacrifice to defend our way of life and democracy and who gave their today for our tomorrow, um, which is, uh, I suspect, probably what most people would, would understand remembrance to be. But it also is a way of bringing communities together. So communities across Britain, irrespective of faith, ethnicity or culture, share a history of service and sacrifice from the two world wars through to the present day. So remembrance is a time to reflect on what we have in common. Um, it's obviously a bit of a, uh, a misnomer that uh, remembrance purely um, is about, to put it starkly, white British men and women. It's It's not about that at all. And building on to the next point, to understand who we are, Remembrance in its current guise and Britain in its current guise is best understood by an understanding that British and Commonwealth servicemen and women in their millions served and sacrificed together during two world wars and then participated in the rebuilding of Britain after them. So, for example, the Windrush generation that came, out, came uh, over to Britain not long after the end of the Second World War, many had been uh, uh, West Indian airmen that served in the RAF. And those that came over from the subcontinent later, many had served in the British Indian Army, um, either in Europe or in the Far East. So there are these connections to the Second World War that are present in how Britain looks today and how Britain is today. Um, and I think it's important that we, rem we remember that that service and sacrifice, it kind of is, is there visually before us in, in Britain and to learn. As we remember the service and sacrifice of so many who came from every walk of life and from every background, whether they served a hundred years ago or today, the act of remembering reminds us that we must all continue to strive for a better, a more peaceful future. Um, this is just re-emphasising the point that remembrance is not about glorifying war. It's not about celebrating victories. It's uh, or or marking marking even marking heroism in, in some respects. But it's it's about remembering all those individual acts of service and sacrifice, um, and remembering that those acts of service and sacrifice have given us the world and the freedoms and way of life that we enjoy today. Um, and it's now our task and responsibility to try and ensure that their service and sacrifice is not um, was not in vain. That we try and build a better world and one free of war and conflict. So in terms of what we do to help tell these stories and promote our and promote our remembrance work, um, in recent years, we've developed um, over 100 different educational products for key stages one to five, from assemblies and lesson plans to book clubs and whole school activities that we um, that are available on our Teaching Remembrance Hub. And they share stories of from Britain, from the Commonwealth and from other allied nations. Um, and look to both tell the story of, of kind of the broadest range of people that served and sacrificed and to give children uh, and families and parents a, a chance to really understand what remembrance is and make it very personal to them. Um, and they're all absolutely free to download off the, uh, the Royal British Legion's Teaching Remembrance Hub. So if you're looking for that, if you typed in Royal British Legion Teaching Remembrance into Google, for example, it would come up as, a, as the first thing there. Community engagement. So in recent years, we've been building on our, our work alongside other organisations, communities, institutions, businesses and others to encourage acts of remembrance. And again, in whatever way 
a community individual organization wishes to remember and to tell the stories of those who served and sacrificed and to develop partnerships to support remembrance going forward. So one of the, the kind of the largest bits of work, if you like, is to highlight stories such as Noor's um, to show people of, of all backgrounds that the kind of vast array of those who served and sacrificed um, and for numerous reasons, I mean, one being the curriculum at the moment, which only allows teachers really to kind of talk about particularly the Second World War within a very, a very thin veneer of the Second World War that sort of runs from, you know, the rise of, of Hitler through the kind of few battles in northern France and on to Berlin and misses out so much of the of the different peoples and theatres of conflict it's our it's our role to kind of highlight those stories and bring them to life so that communities up and down the country and individuals can see that actually this was a massive collective effort and without that you know uh, victory would never have been possible and we work to highlight and promote remembrance more generally so whether it be the remembrance glade at the national Ar memorial arboretum which is um which was opened a, uh, a year ago um uh, the national commemorative anniversary anniversaries we have to so you may have seen in recent years d-day 75 um marking the 100th anniversary of the first world war um vj day uh, 75 or in the festival of remembrance itself the annual televised um broadcast then we try to look for ways to tell the remembrance story um in as wide a range of uh, ways as possible and I wanted to end really by kind of bringing home a particular quote that I read um, a couple of years ago that stuck with me ever since that highlights the collective service and sacrifice that so many made. And this is particular to uh, a community from South Asia, um, in this instance, the Nepalese community. So in 1940, the Prime Minister of Nepal, in response to the British Minister in Kathmandu, who had asked after the fall of France in 1940, so bearing in mind at this point, Britain is alone in Europe in terms of having any ind independent and free allies to, to work with. So France has fallen, the Benelux nations have fallen, Norway's gone, Poland's gone. They are all occupied by Germany uh, to differing degrees. And so Britain is, is kind of uh, allyless in Europe. And so from an outsider's point of view, it looks as though Britain is about to lose the war. Um, the British Minister in Kathmandu has asked the Prime Minister of Nepal for, to recruit an addition to be able to recruit an additional twenty battalions for the Gurkha Brigade, and for Gurkha troops to be allowed to serve in any part of the world. So, for those twenty battalions, for example, to be able to go and serve in Britain as a as a as a form of defence against any potential German invasion. Um, and the Prime Minister of Nepal responded, does a friend desert a friend in time of need? If you win, we win with you. If you lose, we, we lose with you. And place the whole of the Nepalese army, along with um, enabling Britain to recruit as many additional Gurkhas as they wished at the disposal of the British Crown. And I think this highlights two things. One is that we need to understand the collective nature of service and sacrifice. And the second is to kind of, as Noor's story does in in one way, and I'm sure as Paul can talk about in terms of the many other agents who serve with the SOE, that Britain never stood alone. There is a uh, a myth that's perpetuated that, you know, the war started, France fell, Britain held off Germany until we, until America arrived, which is patently untrue. From the moment Britain declared war, you know, if you if if you're being very crude about it, a quarter of the planet was part of the British Empire at that point, or British territories, or British dominions, and so you know, many willingly came and served with Britain. Uh, you know, there was people from the West Indies who paid their own paying their own fare to board ships and come and serve um, in the RAF. As I mentioned earlier, there's millions of people from the subcontinent who fought in Burma, in Italy, in North Africa, in Greece, um, and so on. And without whom, there is no way, neither 
that Britain either could have withstood uh, the German assault early on in the war or could have then turned the tide and with America and others go on to win the war. And I think that just needs repeating. And it's 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 one thing that uh, I think is perhaps what makes some of our work quite difficult in that that has become a kind of a pervasive myth in Britain. Um, and it's one that, um, as I've kind of tried to out, uh, outline, is certainly not accurate. And finally, um, if you get the chance, we have worked with the uh, with the South Africa uh, South Asian um, Heritage Month to develop a, a small page on their website that looks at 100 years of service and sacrifice from the South Asian community, um, highlighting 20 stories. And there could have been thousands, if not millions of stories to potentially highlight to try to whittle them down to 20 kind of particularly interesting or unusual or exceptional stories um, uh, that you um, have the chance to go and read through um, and get an idea of kind of some of the different forms of service and sacrifice performed performed by so many men, men and women from either the S South Asia itself or of South Asian descent who now serve, for example, in the British Armed Forces. Um, and I hope you enjoy that. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was really, really informative and really powerfully said as well that Britain um, could not have um, held back Germany on its own and that it was a collective effort. I think um, I think you're right. There is a pervasive message that uh, a pervasive myth even that uh, purports the opposite. And that can be quite a damaging uh, narrative when we start to uh, when we start to look at when we start to look at these things, I, I, I think right. it. Yeah, I, I think it. It has two kind of. It it produces two things really. One is for communities to believe that they've never, part, never partook or never served and sacrificed, and to not even try to look into their own history, which I think in itself is a, is a sad thing. And on the flip side of that, it gives rise to other communities believing that they, you know. They didn't need anybody else's help, but it mm. was a, you know, a one community effort, so to speak. And because our history does not include a full picture of what actually happened, then then the national that gets embedded in the national conscience, doesn't it? Yeah. And therefore, a new history is written, and and then what we then have are stories, and then those stories stop getting told and we lose them and I think that there is a there I think we're entering a shift now actually open question to everybody do you think we are entering a shift in 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 time where where people are holding on to these stories with more with more vigor and and with more determination and and if so why do you think that is well <laughs> I mean, from my from my personal perspective, I think without wanting to bring bring the Brexit word into any discussions any further, I think both sides of the argument there highlighted different parts of, particularly the Second World War and what it meant as as arguments for either staying in or leaving the EU. Mm. Um, and I th so I think there's still a a job of work to be done in terms of helping particularly the younger generations so younger generations of brits of whatever background to be honest to understand to understand how how much others gave for them and how they fit into british society um because obviously remembrance can be quite It can almost become it, it can be seen as kind of a part of a national identity so how you feel about being british can can kind of tailor how you think about remembrance mm. and, I th and i and i think we i think we need to do more to kind of tell tell the widest possible story um but you know i think as many white british veterans of the second world war would tell you if you if you didn't serve in 
D-Day, again, being very crude here, then your service and sacrifice was hardly remembered anyway. For example, the 14th, those that served in the 14th Army in, in South Asia, mm-hmm. you know, which you know, pretty much 85% or over 80% at least were of South Asian background mm-hmm. or origin. Um, or those, again, those as men that served in Italy and fought at Monte Cassino along with Maoris from New Zealand, Sikhs from the subcontinent and, you know, a myriad of nations representing, I think, every continent on the planet bar Antarctica. You know, they, those stories I haven't been told. And until we do tell those stories and until we have a better understanding of, of kind of the impact that had on who we are as a nation, um, I think we'll 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 always struggle a little to kind of expand the amount of communities who are who want to engage remembrance. Mm. No, I, I I agree, and I think uh, Natasha that people are getting more becoming far more aware than they were before. Uh, I get on an average at least two or three emails from people saying we know you know our ancestors. He was my grandfather, great grandfather <coughs> was war. We don't know which regiment. We don't know anything, but we want to know. So there is this thing of wanting to know, which I is love that. a lot of it. And um, I think it gives a sense of belonging, isn't it? Because, 100%. I, you know, when I came here, I came here in 87, and the view was that remembrance was for white people. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, most people stayed away, apart from those who were veterans and who actually marched. And now I think that hopefully will be, you know, as you know, there is a sense of belonging and you know that this war was fought on the shoulders of all these people who came from the colonies and it mm. was not one single-handedly. And so 2.5 million in the Second World War and all the troops from Africa everywhere. So the more they feel that they were part of this and they they feel included, I think that would, um, you know, just, just help that much. It would help social, you know, it would help relationships. I agree. So. I agree. It feeds directly into national identity because it is such a it's such an important anchor point in the history of this country, and it is such an important um, story in the language of the success of this country and how this country overcame mm-hmm. such adversity. And and it's such a unifying point where so many people were together on it. And and it's an interesting thing. I think I think we are moving towards a shift and, and all credit to you. It starts with people like you, you know, banging on doors going, this was an exceptional lady. Will people listen? And you have and, and you keep these memories alive. And now what is mirrored back are people knowing that they had relatives that were part of the war effort. And um, and they don't know the specifics, but they know enough. They know enough to know that there is a semblance of belonging here and they know enough to claim it. And and the fact that there is comfort around claiming it, it, I think, is the beauty of all of this. And I think it's where the two the, the two sides of this meet in the middle. And that's really that's really where the beauty of this is i think and we have um we have a campaign called our stories matter that we started last year with south asian heritage month and one of the things that struck me the most from it was um it's a campaign that invites people to share photographs and stories of family and home and migration and partition and love and food and heritage and identity and all lovely things like that and and celebrate who you are but also talk about difficult parts of, of you know of of life being us we had so many photographs of um people's grandparents and and um people's grandparents medals and and photographs of them in the war and and photographs where they said i don't know where this is from but i know that it's i know that they were in the war and i just have this picture and it was extraordinary to see these this this wall of 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 commemoration but but that they had nowhere to put there was no place for this before there was nowhere to put it before and and we invite you all to to contribute again because we want to see you and and you are part of this you are absolutely part of this and and it's i think it's such a powerful a powerful thing and and for both both sides of this this conversation to be in consensus with one another, I think is an extraordinary, 
because I, I I know that ten years ago I don't think I don't think this this kind of conversation would have been happening, and ten years ago you were campaigning for the memory of Noor to be recognised. So it is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And we had to start from scratch, you know, but <laughs> for the permissions, who is Noor? <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. You know, who is she? And then you know, start from scratch because yeah, it comes to somebody like Gandhi. You know, people know him. Noor in Khan, it was always like, Noor who? <laughs> you start from there. But, uh, but it's okay, she, her story is known now. And in fact, Paul, I know we were talking before that he has these extraordinary stories of um, all the other SOE activities, which uh, mm. I'd love in India. <laughs> so, yep, sorry, I won't talk anymore. <laughs> No, you, you're you welcome to talk. <laughs> no, no, I, I want to hear Paul's stories too. <laughs> yes, yeah, Paul, do tell us. This sounds fascinating. Um, yes, I mean, it was just in, in preparation for tonight that I started looking at um, SOE in India. And, um, I mean, I've, I've done a lot on, on SOE, Special Operations Executive, over the years, and predominantly that is in uh, Europe, uh, with some in the Middle East and some in the Far East. And India isn't, isn't covered much at all, but there was a very important SOE force called Force 136, which was uh, headquartered in India and what was then Ceylon. Um, but now looking at the, the files, so again, these are the files which are available at, at Kew in the, in the mm -hmm. UK National Archives. And there's a fantastic the file. On the, on the history of SOE in India, which gives you a, a superb structure chart with with all the, the establishments on it. And I don't think uh, that's oh, the wow. sort of thing, but um, that's a, a, a page from it. And I don't think I've seen such a neat structure chart which lists all the establishments in India. And there are, there are seven of them, uh, headquarters in Pune, um, parachute training and uh, reception committee training at Jessore, uh, Calcutta covered um, propaganda and uh, photo, photographic skills. And then at Trinco Mali in uh, Ceylon, there was advanced paramilitary and radio operator training and, um, and also naval training at Trinco Mali with uh, two holding camps as well. And to me, this is, this is completely new. And if I hadn't been participating tonight, I probably wouldn't have uh, looked at this for some years yet. I'm actually doing something about Dutch SOE at the weekend. So this has uh, opened my eyes a little bit. And um, and also, when you look back, there were um, operations actually conducted in India. And when Singapore fell, the first SOE people in India had come from Singapore, as Singapore mm -hmm. fell. And frighteningly, the, the plans and the training that was undertaken, which was undertaken of um, Indian population, the plans were for a scorched earth policy. So we took, we the British took uh, 150 Indian trainees who were from the Indian Communist Party and so uh, avowed enemies of the, the potential Japanese invader. And we were training them in sabotage to take place as a scorched earth policy when the Japanese invaded because it was expected the Japanese would come. Um, so that was the main element from uh, June 1943 to February 1943. And then as the Japanese uh, threat receded, then SOE went over onto the offensive planning. And with Force 136, they were creating different country sections to then go and operate in places like Thailand, Burma, uh, etc. And again, the Indian personnel were used for some of those operations. But... Um, Something also cropped up which uh, made me smile because I remember the film The Sea Wolves in 1980, and I suspect not many of you will, uh, but it was uh, David Niven, British actor, and uh, Gregory Peck, the famous American actor. And uh, I remember this film. Uh, sea Wolves uh, was actually an SOE operation in India, in Goa, against a German ship that was in the harbour and was reporting shipping movements to German U-boats operating off India. And there were an incredible number of sinkings until um, the British SOE engaged a number of volunteers from what we would up until recently have called the Territorial Army. It was the light Calcutta horse, and these tended to be uh, 
um, semi-retired British chaps of a certain age. And uh, they got these together and they succeeded in sinking the uh, ship in the harbour at Doha. And that uh, dramatically reduced U-boat sinkings of Allied shipping. So that was a, another little one in a, a film, <laughs> 1980, The Sea Wolves was about that. And I had no idea at the time what, uh, what SOE was. So there is a story to be told, particularly of the, the use of India and what was then Ceylon as a major training base for SOE in Southeast Asia. Uh, there is one book, I think, that I've seen, Special Operations in Southeast Asia, 1942-1945, by David Miller. I don't think that's a, a relative, is it, Joe? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no proceeds. Uh, <laughs> But, um, I mean, uh, if he wants to offer me some, I'll take them. Yeah. But uh, that looks a, a decent book if anyone wants to, to learn more. And I'd love there to be a volunteer out there um, in India or Sri Lanka who would uh, like to go and investigate these old British bases and, and see if anything remains of them. That's incredible. It really is. I was going to ask as well, actually, while you were talking, whether um there was some sort of book list to put together for anybody that wants to go actually for, for all of you really because i think you're all so knowledgeable in your respective areas around these around this this these issues and around this this subject when it comes to research when it comes to just um wanting to know more about it as well and i think if 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 you're coming at it from the perspective of somebody of south asian heritage that for example if you had a relative that was part of the war effort but that's really all that you know where do you go from there and and it, I, I would if you if it was something that you were happy to do i would love to put some sort of starter's guide book list together of of just where where you could where you could start with it and read around um how how to how to trace back you know the ancestry and and for example, I had no idea all, all the records records were in queue. I had no idea whatsoever. I was just sitting here in London, completely oblivious <laughs> that all of this rich history is just perfectly accessible. And we don't know that. We don't know that about our own our own history at all. It's bananas, isn't it? Um, Shabrani, are we allowed to talk about um, movie and television adaptations <laughs> of our favourite lady, Noor? Is that allowed? <laughs> Yes, of course. Um, well, it's very early stages, so uh, it has been options. Spy Princess has been optioned for a television series. Because I think television box sets seem to be the way to go. Everyone is binging nowadays. And so, yeah, so it's it's early stages. We have to be very patient. Uh, but uh, I have seen, you know, the early drafts of the screenplay. So the screenplay is by Olivia Hetreid. Uh, she wrote um, Girl with the Pearl Earring and a oh, lot fantastic. Of other fantastic um, screenplays. And uh, yes, uh, the million dollar question is uh, Frida Pinto is going to play Noor. So uh, she's That's also amazing. going to be executive produce and stuff. So well, fingers crossed and lots of patience <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Okay, we have we have lots of comments and things coming through. Natasha, could yeah. I just pick up something you said earlier when you were Absolutely. talking to Shabani? Because you said mm -hmm. um, something about not only is it a uh, was new an inspiration for um, Asian people, but also for women generally. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Um, Noor was was one of uh, thirteen women who who died um, out of thirty nine who served with French Section SOE, mm -hmm. and just that alone has inspired the interest of so many women in a subject which wouldn't normally be the case. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we run a secret World War II learning network and 40 something percent of our members are women. Mm -hmm. And for what might normally be a boys anorak military history type uh, <laughs> subject, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's pretty amazing, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. it just goes to show um, how inspiring the women agents can be, mm -hmm. even if you know they were a minority of, of mm -hmm. the agents. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they suffered disproportionate losses in French section. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, whether they were good, bad, or indifferent as agents, they were all incredibly courageous. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. In Absolutely. fact, uh, um, 13 September, while you know people are on air, and you can also put this out later, uh, 13 September is um, Noor's death anniversary, and we always have a little um, event in uh, Gordon Square. So it's uh, it's an open event do feel free to come uh, joe was there one year uh, i remember so joe please come paul do join us i will confirm the timing so we haven't yet uh, decided what time but it's usually in the afternoon around three but i will confirm that but the date is there to save in the diary it's 13 september so mm -hmm. do come and we That's have a no. and, and for the i'm first. definitely coming and, and you can first. see the blue clock, which most people didn't see because it was unveiled in an yeah. empty space <laughs> last year. So it's just next door. So we can have a little little walk, a little noor walk, um, <laughs> followed by tea and cake. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just uh, add that for the first time, we're organizing a commemorative event at the Runnymede Memorial, which oh. is the oh, Air wow. Force's memorial to the missing. And of course, Noor is on there. Yes. And uh, we are commemorating the SOE agents, MI9 agents, and RAF air crew who actually served dropping the agents and supplies mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. who lost their lives. And that's on Sunday, the 28th of November this year. Yeah, okay. So I'll send you all an invitation to that. Oh, well. God, yes, please do. <laughs> I was going to say, I think I would, it would be great if we could coordinate something so that we could do from our end something online that people could get involved in as well. Because And, and kids in school also. This is such an engaging, amazing story. And she's, she's just an incredible, incredible person to learn about and 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 such an amazing anchor point to learn about this time in history and 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 these women in history and i think i think perhaps we could pull something together whereby we are we are for anyone that isn't physically able to to come that i one of my questions was what would you like us to do to mark nor's death anniversary so mm. i think i think there are you know ideally i think for from my perspective, I don't see why this isn't something that nationally could be acknowledged and commemorated because it, she's such an extraordinary, an extraordinary figure and such an extraordinary and important part of British history, I think, and, and such a testament to just bravery and resilience. And I I had even forgotten that it was 10, 10 months <laughs> that she was that she was there and and being tortured and for some reason in that in the canon of that story i just thought that oh it was it happened and then and then she was moved off mm -hmm. afterwards and and when you'd gone through it in your presentation i was just completely flawed completely flawed she's extraordinary they all are <clears throat> and they all were and i think honoring that is something we should just never forget we should never we should never let that pass by. I think it's a very, very important part of remembering who we were, and I think it anchors us to who we are. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think that's very true. And even if, even if you don't, you're not kind of you don't think about remembrance in that way. Kind of news story and other SOE agent stories, ignoring kind of the, the millions of others that did different types of service, mm -hmm. are just excuse my language, bloody fascinating anyway. They're incredible mm -hmm. what some of these men and women did. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, not just Noor, but there's so many others you could make TV and film films out because of, of, of what they did. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd absolutely advise anyone to go and, and find out what they can. And if you wanted, Natasha, a book to start from, although it's quite heavy going, um, there was a book uh, by Dr. Jonathan Fennell called Fighting the People's War. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. talks about the role of kind of across the Commonwealth um, during the Second World War. So from Canada through to uh, undivided India and from Australia through to the troops from East and West Africa that fought in Burma. So that it's a, it's a, it's a very good starting point to kind of get a feel for mm -hmm. the backgrounds, roles, uh, missions of, of, of men and women from across the Commonwealth. Brilliant. I've written that down. It's on my list. Okay, so we've got somebody else saying that they would like a national recognition of NOR, which is <clears throat> which is great. Just love that. Such lovely comments pouring in, honestly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there is a, um, 
an organization, although it's not nor specific, but they are, uh, I think it's Lord Sheikh that runs it, that are trying to get a national memorial uh, to all Muslims that uh, have served uh, British Armed mm. Forces um, since the First World War, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And they're currently trying to raise funds to get um, a memorial for that. And I think it's called the National Muslim Memorial Trust or something very similar to that anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Love that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I know, Joe. Earlier, you were saying, with regard to our the, pa the page on South Asian Heritage Month, that there were that was just a few out of so yeah. many, so mm -hmm. many stories. I would love to hear all the other stories and loop them into our stories matter because I want this wall, just this wall of, of faces that and 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 people and stories and all of this and and I, I want to dive straight into it and I think it's this glorious wonderful thing and and visibility is really um key here I think and and it is a and and hidden history is such a strong theme I think throughout um South Asian Heritage Month and 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 really holding on to so much of of, of what has been uh what has been lost and 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 oh yeah i'm so fascinated i'm just so fascinated by that i would love to i would love to just i would love to to yeah. give those give those faces and stories just a, a home even if it's in the ether mm -hmm. as part of as part of our stories matter just so just so we get to see them again i would love that Absolutely love that. We could talk about this all day and we have gone over time. <clears throat> this was this was an absolute pleasure. It was an absolute joy. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thanks for really Thank great. you for having us. Yeah. Just, it was a pleasure here. Hope That's everybody wonderful. goes back and you know picks up all these books. What we can do is uh, give a reading list and yes. uh, yeah, yeah, that would be wonderful. And then you would share that. Yeah. <laughs> love that. Thank you so much, everybody. We're going to end the broadcast now. We hope you have a very good evening and a happy South Asian Heritage Month. Bye. Thank you. Bye.